Namaste and pranam to everybody. So good to see you all once again on this beautiful Sunday morning. So lovely to see you all. Let's uh, begin with a mantra invocation today and yes. then we'll proceed into the questions. Oh, Asatoma Sadgamaya. Tam Soma Jyotirgamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gameya Om Shanti 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 Om Namah Shivaya Beautiful. With that invocation, Swatishi, Ji. we may start. Yes, yes, Shri Ji. We will start with our first question. This is being asked by KT from Dharam Court. Uh, she's asking, is consciousness naturally evolving? Mm -hmm. OK, good. Um, you see, many times on the when we are on the spiritual journey, in different traditions, in different schools of spirituality, there are different words and the meanings of those words change. And because of that, when we when we follow multiple schools, multiple teachings, these kind of uh, questions or confusions may arise. So let's look at it today from the root level is consciousness naturally evolving let's first look at it what is consciousness when we use the word consciousness chitta chetana what does it really mean what is consciousness consciousness is the isness of life for an example when you say i am the two words, I belongs to the mind and the ego construct that you think you are. Am is the amness, the isness, the chetana that you have, the atman, the soul, the brahman, whatever you want to call it. So consciousness is the isness of life. It's the very base of life. We say in the Vedantic traditions, it never changes, it never, it's never born, never dies, it's always is, ever present, non-changing, non-moving. These are the attributes of consciousness. Very difficult to put attributes to the consciousness, but these are the attributes of consciousness still. If that is so, then there's no question of consciousness being evolving. Do you follow? If something is, is always present, where is the question of it changing or evolving? Please follow it carefully. Now, again, in the Vedantic tradition, we say that there are four stages of consciousness. We'll look at the evolution part later. First, understand there are four stages of consciousness. Or we can say that consciousness manifests itself into these four stages. Number one, the waking state of consciousness. So right now you are awake, you're listening to this. That's the waking state of consciousness. In this state, your chetana, your consciousness is awake and listening to this dialogue. Second state of consciousness is the dream state of consciousness. When consciousness manifests itself or identifies itself with the dream, you go to sleep, you see some dreams. So consciousness identifies itself with the dream. And for that moment, the dream becomes reality. So whatever consciousness identifies itself with, for that moment, that thing will become your reality. 
So in the waking state of consciousness, which is right now, your consciousness is identified with this waking state. Hence, everything appears to you as reality. In the dream, the dream appears to be a reality. That's the second state of consciousness. The third state of consciousness is, these are states, these are not stages. The third state of consciousness is the deep sleep state of consciousness. When consciousness is non-identified, don't see any dream, you're not wakeful, there's just nothing there. But that's also a state of consciousness. We call it the deep sleep state of consciousness. And then the fourth state of consciousness, which is beyond these three. And that in the Hindi or Sanskrit, we call it Turriya state of consciousness. The ever present, ever awake, the real state of consciousness, the most, now we use the word evolve here. The most evolved or the manifested state of consciousness is the Turiya state. Where? And this fourth state is behind all the three states. It is ever present. So you are uh, awake, but something is sitting behind and watching this, observing this actions of yours. You're dreaming something sitting behind in you and seeing you dream. You're sleeping in deep sleep, sleep where there are no, not even dreams, but something behind you is still awake, which is seeing this sleeping state of consciousness. And that is the reason when you get up in the morning, after a deep, restful sleep, you announce that I slept like a baby. I did not even see any dreams. I just was deeply asleep. How do you know that? Because you were fully asleep without any dreams. How do you? Who knows it within you that you had a deep restful sleep? Which means when all the faculties were shut down, even then, this Turiya state of consciousness, the fourth state of consciousness, was fully awake in you. It's just that most of the time we are not connected with that fourth state of consciousness. We consider the three states of consciousness as our only reality. Right? Consciousness is non changing, non moving, ever present. That is the reason. We say experiences are not real, but the chetana, the consciousness, the atman or the brahman, that's the real thing. Because the definition is. Whatever is ever present, non changing, non moving is the reality. Whatever is transforming, changing, sometimes there, sometimes not there, is illusion, is a dream. So, this body that you, you are carrying, 30 years ago, you did not have the same body. It had a different shape, different features. It's changing. Hence, we don't say that this body is reality. Your thoughts, your mind, constantly different thoughts changing. We don't say the thoughts or the mind is a reality. Your emotions, sometimes you are in a state of pure love, sometimes your state of, you know, not so love, sometimes anger, sometimes, you know, regrets, sometimes fear, all of that. So even emotions are non stable, always changing. Even that too, we say, is not reality. Reality is only that which is not changing ever and that's the turiya the fourth state the witnessing state of consciousness the ever present state of consciousness now that word is the vedantic perspective on what really is consciousness now the question is is consciousness evolving as i said consciousness is not evolving it's always there so what is evolving then is something definitely evolving what is evolving is the mind that is evolving. Few millions of years ago, you only had a reptilian instinctive mind. Then nature helped this mind to evolve. The thinking entered into the mind. The feeling attributes entered into the mind. 
the imaginative attributes, the visualization attributes entered into the mind. And the mind was constantly or is constantly evolving. So it's the mind that is evolving, not the consciousness, which is always ever present, even behind the mind, watching the mind evolve or not evolve. Because anything that can evolve can also go backward. It's always a two way process. You can go up, you can come down also. That is the reason in a lot of human beings, you see largely instinctive animalistic behavior. They have not yet fully become human beings. They're very instinctive. Their instincts of, you know, sleep, anger, uh, food, uh, procreation, all of that just drives them. They are living at the lowest level of their existence. The mind is still at the reptilian level. So the mind in them has taken a backward journey. While nature is progressing, yes, so mind also evolves naturally. But there's a big B U T but. But the problem is. From the reptilian mind to the current state of mind that we have, with the thinking, emoting, feeling, imagining abilities, the ability of love and compassion and all these ability, ability to even try and understand what consciousness is, all these abilities we all have, the mind has evolved. But it has taken millions of years naturally to mind to evolve to this level. We are talking about, or when we are on a spiritual path, we want to have a fully awake mind, totally dissolved into this consciousness, or totally connected with this consciousness, merged with this consciousness. That's the quality of awake mind that we need to progress in this journey, to really enjoy the joy and ananda and the bliss and the love and the sattva of life. Can we then rely just on the natural progression? We don't have millions of years in this life. You as an individual jiva, you don't have millions of years in this incarnation to wait for nature to take over and help the mind to become fully ripe, fully awakened. And then that's how nature has bestowed the qualities on us that with our self-will, utilizing all our abilities, channelizing all our energies, we can take the charge and the decision and act to evolve the mind the way we want to. We can define the timelines of the evolution of our own mind. We can make our own minds awakened, fully awakened. We can do that. That is the power the nature has given you. So nature is doing its own job of evolutioning the mind. And nature has also given you the Shakti, the power, the Siddhi to, to take charge and evolve it to the extent you want. It depends on individual sadhak or the aspirant. What do you do? Do you fully depend, only depend on the nature's process of evolution? Or you also take, utilize nature's powers that it has given to you to work on your own mental mind's evolution and connect it, dissolve it, enter, let the mind enter into the Satchitananda, the pure state, the fourth state of consciousness. That's the choice we have. That is the reason when we start to walk the spiritual process. It is our choice. We choose to walk the process. We could choose to still remain in the dukkha of the world, the sansara, the trap of the sansara. We can still choose to do that. It is purely our choice. But Buddha, when he saw the ultimate dukkhas of the samsara, he chose, he took the decision not to follow the trap anymore. 
he took the decision to go into a process where he can work on his own absolute ultimate evolution of the mind and allow the mind to enter into the Turiya state, the fourth state of consciousness. That's what we call enlightenment, moksha, nirvana. He took it in his own control. He took charge of it. He did not rely on nature. That's the choice you and I have. We all have that choice. Nature is doing its own job. But nature has also given you shaktis, powers. You have the choice to utilize those powers and work on your own evolution. And if you can, if you will work on that with full focus, like a Buddha, then achieving this Turiya state or realizing this Turiya state, it's not achieving. Achieving is a wrong word because it's already there. There's no question of achieving it. Because it's already there, the question is of realizing its presence in you. Realizing its presence in you. And if you do that, like Buddha, in one lifetime, it is a possibility. One lifetime. It's a possibility. But then, it's all one-pointed. Nothing else, no distractions, nothing ever, anything in the world, in the samsara, nothing pulls you towards that. You're there performing your roles, your jobs, your duties, your responsibilities, your dharma, but you're not getting pulled into that. You're totally on the path. Think about this. So that's what is the natural process and the process on which you have controls and powers. So nature has allowed our minds to reach to this level of evolution now, when lots of things of ultimate possibilities are in our control. Depends how well we want to utilize this opportunity. Think about this, Katie. Think about this. Thank you. Thank you, Shriji. Uh, in continuation to this uh, particular question, we received some more questions. So we have uh, one question, if you allow. Yes, please. Uh, the question is being asked by Ranjana ji. Uh, mm -hmm. She is asking, in continuation of the previous question, can we say consciousness is Shiva, the ever-present one, but we feel and understand according to our state of awareness? Yes, absolutely, we can say that. Consciousness is the Shiva, Tattva. There, if you look at the Sanatan philosophy, there are two aspects of it, Shiva and Shakti, Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha, so these are not two as dual. Don't look at it as duality, though to the mind it appears as duality. But actually it is one. From the pure Shiva consciousness, which is one, the he allowed it to be divided into two. I'm using the word he allowed utilizing his free will, his blissful free will to divide it into two. He created the play. The Purusha created the play of Prakriti. So that is the re reason in the iconography you see the Ardhana Rishwar, Shiva and Shakti in one body. It's actually one. Out of that one Purusha, the Shakti evolved or Shakti manifested. And Shiva allowed the Shakti to manifest. And Shakti is the power of the world, the, the energy of the creation. He allowed this Shakti of creation to manifest the entire world around, including you and me. But Shakti without Shiva is nothing. And Shiva without Shakti is also nothing. They're always together. So when the Shakti created this entire manifestation, including this body and mind mechanics, the Purush Tattva was infused into that. And what is the Purush Tattva? The ever-present consciousness. So the Purush Tattva is infused in you and me. The Shiva is infused in you and me. Ma Shakti, Adi Shakti is, in, is, is 
we are all Adi Shakti, we are all manifestation of the Adi Shakti, infused with the consciousness of Shiva. And that's the reason we are alive. When we die, when this body dies, what dies? What really happens? The Purush Tattva is removed from this mechanics. Only the, the elements are, are remained there. And when the consciousness is removed, the Purush Tattva is removed from the Prakriti, Prakriti is dead. The body mind becomes dead. That is what we call dead. So in death, what has really happened? The consciousness, the ever present Purush Tattva has been removed. And when they both come together, we experience life. So you're absolutely right. That's how it is. Consciousness is the Shivatva in this entire Jagat. There's not even a single thing which is manifested, even a cup even a rock, even a stone, which does not have consciousness. Without that, it just it will just disintegrate. Yeah, it's a deep subject. Huh? Today, we've started from a very deep Vedantic perspective. I'll not go into the more layers of this, but yes, you have understood it, right? And based on our own state of mind, our level of mental awareness, our level of evolution of mental awareness, we understand these things. We understand what is Shiva. For somebody, Shiva is just a human being or, or a being which happened. For some, it's the Purush Tattva of the entire universe, entire cosmos. With our own states, we understand and look at reality in different ways. But just to reinforce, the definition is of reality. That which never changes, which is ever present, is the only reality of this world. Everything that keeps moving, changing, transforming itself is the illusion. If you stay with this, you will see that you will start to get the glimpses of the pure Shiva Tattva in you. Be with that. Meditate on this, Ranjanaji. Meditate on this. Thank you. Thank you, Shriji. So we will come to our next question. Um, our next question is being asked by Maya Ji. We will just present it. Yes. Maya Ji has asked this question. She is asking, uh, Namaste Ji, how can the Runanu Bandh be purified? And further, what can be done to balance the five elements inside our body? Okay. I think uh, in one question, there are two questions and two very different questions. <laughs> one is about the karmic role and the other is about five elements and how to purify that in the body, which enters into the uh, more of the Ayurvedic understanding, so to say. Uh, so I'll take the first question for the understanding here. There are two concepts that we have in the Sanatana Dharma. One is the Runanabandha concept. The other is karmic debt, the theory of karma. They are quite interrelated. One is the subset of other, we can look at it that way. For some of you, this could be a new word because normally we use the words of karma or the theory of karma, karmic debts, karmic manifestations, etc. Runanabandha is a word which we don't use in much in, in the regular spiritual discourses. But it's important to understand this. What is Runanabandha? Let's first understand that. The first, so there are two words in this, Runana. It's, it's basically Rin. Rin is the debt. The debt that you have for with somebody. Huh? Or this could also be translated as a bond. Yeah, and debt and bond. You can look at it that way. Anubandha is the relationship, the connection. Yeah. So together, the word would mean a relationship of a, of a debt, a debt relationship. Or we can look at it as a debt that arises out of a relationship. It's called Runanabandha. Yeah. Now, uh, to simplify this. You're born in a family, your parents, your sibling, your loved ones. 
and then you make connections you make friends you you have so many relationships in the world with every connection and relation that you experience in the world that you form in this world there is a energetic connection that you form with that person there is a, a emotional connect that you form with that person over a period of time this emotional or energetic connection becomes a debt becomes a bond and this needs to be purified otherwise you get stuck with that debt you follow it's very similar like a karmic debt but this is more physical and emotional in nature so imagine you've you've met with a new friend you start to spend a lot of time with that friend and you hug that friend you you eat with that friend now every interaction even at the physical level at the thought level at the emotional level with this next person is creating a bond is creating some level of debt uh, some um, what is the word i'm looking for some kind of entanglement is happening some kind of entanglement is happening now these entanglements slowly becomes your samskaras or gets converted into karmic debt now let's say you are forced to go away from that person now this bond this energetic thought level emotional debt that you have formed with that person will carry with you at some point and that is the reason it will keep pulling you back it's like a bank you've taken loan from the bank the, the people of the bank will keep chasing you so the thoughts of this person the energetic level feelings of this person will keep pulling you you might call it a missing but what you call a missing is actually the pulling of this runanabandha you follow outwardly you will see that i love this person i love my child and that i'm not i'm away from my partner i'm away from my parent i'm away from my friend and i'm missing that person but it's the bandha it's the debt of that relationship energetic entanglement of that relationship which is pulling you now if you're not able to get back connected with that person and clear this off you will try and form similar connections elsewhere so the entanglement starts to convert itself into the trap story of karma begins now we are forever entangled trapped in this in this loop of karmic connections you asked i think you asked how to purify it or balance it or something like that what is the way out i'll tell you a story maya to understand this what is the way out of this it's a story from the life of krishna i heard it yesterday only and i think it will give you a lot of clarity now once krishna and if you know about krishna krishna had a lot of uh, uh, female friends also male friends and female friends also we call them gopis so once krishna was uh, playing with the gopis uh, in the forest in uh, mathura and uh, there's a yamuna river flowing there so at the bank of the yamuna river imagine just imagine the scene krishna is playing with the gopis now if you know a little bit about krishna we also say scriptures also say that krishna had many wives thousands and i think the number goes some 16000 wives because he had killed asura and asura had you know uh, forcefully married these 16000 women and when he killed the asura these women were abandoned they became widowed and they said now what we will do and krishna adopted some story like that we'll not go into the details but krishna had many wives including rukmini and then radha and everybody anyways 
on the other bank of the yamuna one of krishna's guru came and he was sitting there a, a guru a sage called rishi durvasa he was on the other side of the bank yeah krishna said look my guru has come on the other side of the bank and uh, i want to go there and i want all of you to prepare meal and food for his offering we will present that to rishi durvasa so uh, all the gopis prepared huge amount of food and they they reached the bank of the river but by that time the river was flooded and uh, they asked krishna how do we cross this river krishna said you pray to the river and just tell the river on behalf of the nitya brahmachari allow us to cross this river on behalf of a nitya brahmachari nitya brahmachari is who is ever celibate on behalf of the krishna who is ever celibate please allow us to cross cross the river give way the gopis were confused they said krishna we all know you have thousands of wives how can we say this lie to the river saying that krishna who is ever eternally celibate on his behalf allow us to cross the river it's a lie krishna said you please make the request if the request is true the river will give way if the request is false if it's a lie river will not give way gopis were very confused they prayed to the river oh mighty yamuna on behalf of krishna who is nitya brahmachari ever celibate please allow us to cross you the story goes and the river gave way gopis and krishna crossed the river who went to the other side everybody was absolutely confused anyways there rishi durvasa was sitting they offered huge amount of this food and it ap appeared that he is not eaten for years together he ate all the food 10 20 large plates and bowls of food he rishi durvasa ate everything after eating they thanked him because he has accept, accepted their prasad and after thanking they said okay allow us to go back and when they turned around the river was again in the furious uh, flood they said what do you we do how do we cross to the other side and go back to our homes rishi uh, no krishna said to the gopis again oh gopis pray to the mighty yamuna and this time pray to her on behalf of the rishi durvasa who is ever on fast nitya upavasi who is eternally at on fast eternally on fasting allow us to cross this river gopis were again so very confused we have just fed him in front of our own eyes he has eaten this entire food how can we say this lie to the river that on behalf of the ever upavasi nitya upavasi ever fasting person krishna said please make anyway you just make this prayer to the river so be it oh yamuna on behalf of this nitya upavasi the one who is ever on fasting eternally on fasting allow us to cross cross you and go to the other shore river gave way and they crossed the river went to the other shore now they just caught hold of krishna saying that we don't understand your games what is this there must be some secret some message some mystery in this tell us that krishna said this is who we are and this is how we are in the world but we are not in the world remember we talking about karmic debt and runa bandha krishna said Yes I have 16000 wives I love all of them but I am not the doer of any action I am just the witnesser of any act every action no action touches me my interiority because I am in the tulya state the fourth state of consciousness where I watch everything
whatever this body this mind this emotions does i i'm not entangled with that i'm ever present watching the show and so is rishi durvasa he's eaten all the food but his body has eaten the food he does not identify himself with the body he does not identify himself with the mind or the emotions he is very separate from that the sense of iness is not there in rishi durvasa or me we are in the state of amness or isness where the actions happen through the body and the mind whatever on the situation whatever dharma has to be performed whatever action has to be taken using the body and the mind combination the actions are performed but we are not entangled with the actions we are ever standing behind the body mind emotions watching the play we're not entangled with this and that is the way you purify your runanabandha you can't go out in the world trying to fix this runanabandha with every person every person of this life and every person with whom you had runanabandha of the previous lives you please you cannot do that asambhav hai ye impossible what is the way out this is the way out that whatever has to happen in the most dharmic way using your body and mind appropriate to that situation you perform that action very detached from the performance of the action you are not the doer of the action slowly you enter into this state you are at your office in your job you're performing the dharma the duty that has to be performed you are not the doer you allow the the work to happen through you you're not the doer you don't claim the fame of it you're very detached from that do you follow now what about the past runanabandhas with this you will not create new runanabandhas what about the past runanabandha what do you do that for that you do prayer you meditate and in that prayer in that meditation in that acts of service seva what you do you seek for unconditional forgiveness from all the people known and unknown whom you have un knowingly or unknowingly whom you might have hurt you seek their forgiveness you forgive all the people knowingly or unknowingly who might have hurt you in some ways this life or past lives you feel deep gratitude in your heart for whatever life has blessed you for all the people who have blessed you with some experiences with some knowledge all the people you feel that deep gratitude and with that gratitude you give your dhanyavad your thankfulness to them slowly you're attack you're detaching yourself from all these runanabandhas because i said practically you can't go to every person and do that you make very heartful prayers in your deep meditative states from for this you forgive you seek forgiveness and you feel feel immense gratitude even for people who might have hurt you you feel gratitude because every hurt every unpleasant experience has also taught you something also helped you evolve to some extent you pay off that debt also that is the reason some of the techniques like uh let's say hoponopono the brazilian if if i'm not wrong the brazilian technique hoponopono where you just say i Please forgive me if I've done anything wrong to you, etc., etc. These affirmations, if you do heartfully and not just mentally, most of the time we say these prayers just mentally, mechanically. No, no, no. Before you say these prayers, you enter into states of meditation, which are non-mental anymore. You're not in the mind zone anymore. You have entered into deep state of your being, and from that purified state. these prayers must come 
that's when the prayers become very authentic, powerful, non-mechanical. We call them prayers from the being. And when the prayers from the being happens, that's when you start to cut all these runanabandhas. And that's the way out. Think about this. Think about this. Otherwise, forever, we are pulled by these unseen threads which keep pulling us towards people, towards situations. We say we manifest situations because these unseen threads are just pulling and creating the same situations in our life again and again because of the Runanabandhas. Yeah. Two things I've said about this prayerfulness and the way the prayers must be said and what must be said in the prayers. And I've also said what zone you perform any action in. Not in the zone of I am the doer. In the zone of I am not the doer. It's happening through me. I am just the witnesser, the watcher, the awareness, the consciousness behind this, seeing the play, not the doer, because the doer becomes entangled with the act of doing. You're trapped. Remember the story of Krishna. It is very powerful story. If you can decode this, it will change your life. Think about this, Maya. I hope it will help. <laughs> Thank you. Ji Swati Ji. We thank you, can... thank you, Shriji. One more question, I think. We can take one. Yes, please. Okay, sure. So we'll just present one question now. Maya ji is here, so she is sending you love for answering a question. So our next question is also live from Himalayan Abdul ji. Uh, this is in continuation to, uh, I think, our first question. He's saying, what is your view on Advait? Are we different from Shiva? People say we are manifestation of Shakti. Question remains, who's Shakti? Is there anything other than Shiva? Kindly enlighten. As I said earlier, let me repeat that. What is Shakti? is nothing but an aspect of Shiva. The Purusha and Prakriti is ever together. They are one. They, that's the Advaita. They're non-dual. That's the Advaita. And that's the, that's the reason I said the iconography of Ardha Narishwari. When you go down to the Shiva statue, you must actually inwardly see you're going down toward the Nareshwar. The one feet of Shiva, the other feet of Shakti. Because to our mind and our eyes, which is only tuned to see everything in duality. Let me repeat this statement. Our mind and our eyes are only tuned to see all our senses. Even the perceptive mind is only tuned to understand, see, comprehend the duality. Advaita is just a concept for the mind. Advaita, according to me, can only be realized. This Advaita, this oneness of Shiva and Shakti is a matter of realization. But how do you start the process of realization? By understanding. First level is the mental understanding. So what is Shakti? Is just an aspect of the Purusha, the, Shak, the Shiva. The ever present Shiva, the consciousness of this entire Jagat, the entire cosmos, just felt to create the manifested world. And out of the Shiva, like we've heard the story that, you know, from his one strand of hair, his Jata, you know, he, he created Virabhadra. These are all the manifestations of Shiva, right? Virabhadra, who is a ferocious Rudra form of Shiva, is non-different from Shiva. He is not two. He is not number two Shiva. He is an aspect of the same Shiva. Similarly, what we call as Prakriti or Shakti is the aspect of the same Shiva. 
It's the same Shiva energy. Yeah. Same Purusha manifest himself as Prakriti. And when the time comes, the Kala wants, the Prakriti dissolves back into the Purusha. This entire manifested Jagat get dissolved back into the Shiva Tattva. Yeah. Because from there it emerges, it goes back into them. It's like that's the flow. Because eventually it's the one thing. Yeah. Is there anything which is not Shiva? Absolutely not. There's nothing which is not Shiva. You're absolutely right. Everything is Shiva if you know what Shiva is. If you realize what Shiva is, then for you, in your Chetana, in your Chitta, in your consciousness, everything is Shiva. Every blade of grass is Shiva. Every breath is Shiva. Everything seen is Shiva. Everything non-seen is Shiva. And hence, you too are Shiva. We call it Shiva Tattva. As I said earlier, without this Shiva Tattva, life within your body is not possible. You're breathing, you're surviving, you're listening to this, you're trying to comprehend this just because Shiva Tattva is present in you. The day the Shiva Tattva is removed, only the, the dead thing remains. Only the Prakriti remains and then in due course, the Prakriti, each element is also dissolved into its own Prakritic nature. Everything dissolves. Without Shiva Tattva, life is in you not possible. Life in anything is not possible. Yeah. So, yes, everything is Shiva. You too are a Shiva. But this is not a matter of mental understanding because if this just becomes a mental understanding, we fall into deeper darkness of illusion. We create mental constructs then, mental notions then. That is the reason. I personally don't talk on these matters more or much. I Because these are the matters of deep sadhana and realizations. Sometimes by talking, by listening to these, the mind constructs some frameworks. We get trapped in that. It's a very tricky zone, my friend. How, but you asked, and I'm still talking about this with deep prayer in my heart. While I'm speaking these words, I have a deep prayer in my heart. May this, this understanding that is coming from this being right now enters into the beings who are listening just as a understanding or as a small spark and with that spark they must be able to ignite the light of their own inner realization of the shiv tattva realization of the shiv tattva realization of their own advaitic reality that's my deepest prayer i don't want this to become any one of us is only mental understanding mental understanding must be the starting point May this not this may this not create any illusion in us. May with this knowing, we start to walk the process of realizing this, establishing in this, making this our only reality. May that happens. May that happens. That's my wish. That my pray. That my blessings for all of us here. Hope this helps. Thank you. Thank you, Shriji. Ji, Swatiji, we've come to the end. Before we end, let's just close our eyes on this. <clears throat> Sit straight. Keep your spine erect. Just be still. No movement of the body. Eyes completely closed, nothing to see. Bring all your awareness to your breath. Take a deep inhalation in and hold, hold the breath.
and release it now. Take one more inhalation and deep, long breath. Hold. And release it. Take one more deep breath in. And release it. Now take a few normal breaths. Let the breath go in, come out on its own rhythm, its own pace. Just be with the flow of the breath. With every inhalation, let the words that you have heard let them go deep within you. Let the words rest in you. With each breath in, let this knowing be absorbed by you completely. Now with a deep gratitude in your heart, really express your thankfulness to your Sangha, to your Gurus, to your Ishta. Bow down to your Sangha, your Gurus, your Ishta, for it's their blessing that we are able to Be part of such gathering, listen to such discourse, able to contemplate on it, and will eventually realize the truth of this deep gratitude. Om Tat Sat. Om Tat Sat. Om Tat Sat. We may slowly open our eyes now.